now it is. So good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you here in this room, in all the other rooms uh, here at the Experimentarium, and also to every other people on digital media and social media that are following us online. Uh, it took me 30 years of exile to be here today presenting the keynote, uh, and it is my great pleasure today to introduce you to Margaret Wardheim, whose work you're probably familiar with. So Margaret is uh, internationally acclaimed and award-winning uh, writer and artist with a science background, whose work has been focusing on the dialogue between science, arts, and the wider cultural landscape. Uh, Margaret's work has been uh, on display in prestigious institutions all over the world, including the Smithsonian um, Museum of Natural History and also the Science Gallery in Dublin. And she has been awarded for her science communication work as well. Uh, she has been awarded with the Australian, Cien Australian Ciencia Medal and also received the distinction for the excitement about physics by the American Society of uh, Physics Teachers. Um, just recently, her awesome coral, uh, crochet coral reef project has been on display on the Biennale of Venice. So today she's going to talk to us a little bit about what it means to learn about mathematics. Many of us consider this a formal um, activity, but as we know, mathematics is all around us, from the growth patterns of living organisms to the melodies we all enjoy listening to. So it was the authenticity, the diversity, and may I say beauty of the work that she has been developing, namely together with her sister, twin sister Catherine, in the Institute of uh, Figuring, uh, one uh, Los Angeles-based institute uh, that was founded by, by the sisters, and that has been devoting its work to the appreciation of the aesthetics, the poetry, and the uh, dynamics of science and uh, mathematics together with arts. And it is my great pleasure, without further ado, to ask Margaret to please step on the stage, and the stage is fully yours. Thank you, it's a great, really great pleasure to be here. Um, is it possible that we can have the stage lights down so people can see the images a bit more? Is that possible? As, as much as you can dim them would be fabulous because it really does show the images more. So um, today I'm going to be talking about mathematics as material play. And I'm going to take very seriously the question, does a sea slog know hyperbolic geometry? Which I was delighted to see reading the program also seems to mesh with the take that the uh, keynote speaker tomorrow will be pursuing when she asks the question about slime molds and intelligence. I think you'll find there's quite a few resonances between the two talks. So the work that I'm going to be discussing today arises out of a practice that I do with my twin sister, Christine Wertheim. In Los Angeles, we have formed a very tiny non-profit organization called the Institute for Figuring. And our work is about taking seriously the fact that science and mathematics themselves are poetically and aesthetically enchanted subjects. So there's a whole lot of talk in the world now about STEM to STEAM. I'm sure I don't need to explain that to anyone in this audience. But our work, which can sort of be seen in the light of art and science together, but it's really composed or emerged out of a belief that science and technology and mathematics and engineering don't need to have sort of, as it were, an external creative force coming into them, that they are themselves poetically and aesthetically resonant. And so our work is about trying to engage publics with science and math subjects through revealing and giving people a chance to literally play for themselves with si the beautiful aspects of science and mathematics. So one way we think of our little organization, the Institute for Figuring, is that we consider it to be a play tank. So, you know, in our society, we have things called think tanks, where people go and they think big ideas and they write opinion pieces and they write books. 
Well, that's great, but Chrissy and I believe the world also needs play tanks, places where people can come to play with ideas. So what our work stresses is giving audiences opportunities to literally play with ideas from the STEM subjects. And I noticed delightfully when I read the conference book last night how much play is coming to be seen as an important and um, vital resource and methodology for engaging audiences in science museums. So uh, basically we do a lot of things but a lot of our work has been focused on mathematics and as I'm sure none of you need explaining, we talk about STEM, but mathematics is sort of the orphan child of STEM. It almost never seems to get mentioned, and I think that's a great pity. Um, I went to university and studied science and mathematics myself, and mathematics is pure beauty. You know, sometimes I say to my artist friends, if you want pure creativity, do pure maths. But we're used to thinking in our society of mathematics as being a purely symbolic activity, something that has to be engaged with through textbooks and equations. But in fact, you can engage with a lot of mathematics through material play practices, things like crocheting, knitting, um, paper folding, weaving sticks together. There's a whole lot of, as it were, like kindergarten-like practices that actually enable people to connect with really quite deep ideas in math. And the one that I'm going to talk to you about today is hyperbolic geometry, which is, um, excuse me, is there any water here? I'm just somehow feeling, um, ah, sorry. Sorry, I think I'm still suffering from a bit from jet lag. I'm sorry, did you, do I need to talk louder? Oh, is there, oh, I see it. Yes, I get it. Is this, this one working too? Ah, oh, is that better? I've just turned it off. No, okay. So the, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the subject of hyperbolic geometry and the way that hyperbolic geometry can be engaged with through a very wide range of actually Im of embodied activities and embodied um, practices. So hyperbolic geometry is a kind of geometry that's an alternative to the Euclidean geometry we learn about at school. Now mathematicians spent almost a thousand years trying to prove that hyperbolic geometry or anything like it wasn't possible. And that's because it violates one of the axioms of Euclid's geometry. But although mathematicians and some of the greatest mathematicians of our culture, people like Gauss, tried to demonstrate that this mathematics wasn't possible, it turns out that things in nature have been doing it for hundreds of millions of years. Lettuces and kales and all the frilly vegetables all those curly frilly structures that you see widely throughout nature are examples of um, biological manifestations of hyperbolic geometry. And we see them in cactuses and kales, but the hugest place we see them is in sea creatures. So here's um, a hyperbolic sea sponge. And it turns out that um, the ocean, and particularly on coral reefs, there is a huge taxonomy of hyperbolic wonders. And that's because hyperbolic structures serve a very important biological function. Does anyone here want to guess what that is? You're a science audience. <laughs> Have a guess. <laughs> so why, why would it be that in the sea, having sort of curvy surfaces might have a concrete purpose. It increases surface area and what's the value of that? Yes. You, a, yes, it, a lot of people are getting it. It's because if you're a filter feeding organism and you can't go chasing after your lunch, you have to wait for it to waft by you in the sea. You want to maximize surface area to get the maximum amount of absorption of nutrient or sometimes of sunlight. 
So hyper nature has inve invented hyperbolic things over and over again, all through nature, but particularly in marine environments on coral reefs, because it serves this wonderful, um, you know, it, it's a maximally efficient solution to a concrete problem, how to get lunch. So it's also used by um, sea slugs and other creatures who have these sort of crenellated flanges which they use for propelling themselves. And again, that's because if you've got the maximum surface area, it helps you sort of gain a, a maximum amount of sort of ability to press the water down and propel yourself. So these are two sea slugs, nudibranchs is the formal name. They're creatures hundreds of millions of old, years old. They've never heard about Euclid's axioms and don't know that they're possible to be violated. So, but they're realizing this hyperbolic geometry literally in the structure of their being. And so I want to say, I want to ask the question, does a sea slog know hyperbolic geometry because it is embodying it in its being? And I would like to say that on some level, yes, it does. That the not, this kind of embodied knowledge constitutes a true kind of knowing in addition to what we think of as the symbolic way of knowing, which is how I learned hyperbolic geometry when I was at university. Now, as I've said, the sea slugs and the nudibranchs didn't know that this was in theory impossible. But mathematicians from the very beginning, from Euclid's era, had convinced themselves that nothing could violate Euclid's axioms. And so they spent about 2,000 years trying to demonstrate that Euclid's axioms must be true. And in the early 19th century, a number of mathematicians in Europe began to realize that in fact, one of Euclid's axioms, the famous parallel postulate, actually isn't, necessar isn't necessarily true. And they were so worried by this that we have one mathematician, Wolfgang Boyle, writing this wonderful line to his son saying, fear it no less than the sensual passion because it may take up all your time, deprive you of your health, happiness, and peace of mind. Now, we don't used to, we're not used to thinking about mathematics as a subject which inspires kind of passionate response. But this subject did because it was so, it opened, it appeared to be opening up a door to a kind of mathematics that was utterly different to anything that mathematicians had known for 2,000 years. So it is incredibly interesting to me that brainless creatures like lettuces and sea slugs had literally been doing this mathematics when it took human mathematicians with our mighty brains 2,000 years to get over what we thought was an injunction against it. So what is this amazing thing that the sea slug understand and that Gauss struggled with? It turns out there are actually three kinds of geometric surfaces, and we most people are familiar with two of them. The Euclidean surface, Euclidean flat space that we learn about in school, spherical space, which is the surface of a sphere, and it turns out that there's this third option called hyperbolic geometry or the hyperbolic plane. Now, one way of understanding these things, when mathematicians began to formalize it, they realized that they could understand this in, in this very elegant way. You could understand a flat Euclidean surface as something with no curvature. That makes sense, doesn't it? There's no bumps anywhere on a, on a flat tabletop. When you look at the surface of a sphere, think of a beach ball, you have clearly a curved surface. Mathematicians characterize it as a positively curved surface. So if you think about it, you think, well, you've got zero curvature, positive curvature. Does it make sense that you could have negative curvature? Just like you've got zero positive numbers and negative numbers. And it turns out that mathematically it does. So this surface, the hyperbolic surface, is the geometric equivalent of the negative numbers. Now, if you're sitting there thinking a bit bamboozled, that is as it should be, because nobody should think that these things are obvious. Mathematicians, the best mathematicians of our culture, struggled mightily to understand what that might mean. So I'm going to go through very briefly what this is formally in mathematics. There are several different ways of explaining this, but the most canonical one is to look at it in terms of what's called Euclid's parallel postulate. So you all know this. Um, actually, can I see as a show of hands how many people off the tops of their head know what Euclid's parallel postulate is? 
That's very interesting. Very, very few of you. That's really sad. Um, <laughs> it shows you, you know, how mathematics has completely failed to make any traction in the STEM universe, uh, the universe of science communication. But you all do actually know this. You all learned this at school. So Euclid's parallel postulate says if I take a line and a point not on it, that it's how many lines can I draw through the point that never meet the original line? You all know the answer. One. So you know a lot more geometry than you think you do. So Euclid's parallel postulate says there's only ever one line that I can draw through a point that never meets that original line. And there can never be a situation where there's more than one line. Now, that sort of makes intuitive sense. We've all done this a lot on paper. But mathematicians were a bit bothered. It's a very, very complicated axiom. All the other Euclidean axioms are simple things like the definition of a line, the definition of a point, the definition of a circle. This is a very complicated thing to stay it off the top of your head. And so they thought, if it's true, we must be able to prove it's true. And that's why they spent 200 years, almost 2,000 years trying to prove that it must be true from simpler axioms. Now, to give you a hint that why, why would you even think that it might not be true, I can show you a situation where it's a, a different situation where it isn't true. And that is if we take the surface of a sphere. Now, imagine a beach ball. Not, not a solid sphere, but just a hollow sphere like the surface of a beach ball. We can ask the same question. If I have the surface of a sphere, I draw a line, a straight line on my sphere, and I draw a point, we can ask the question, how many other straight lines can I draw through the point that don't meet the first one? Okay, now we have a big philosophical question. What does it mean to talk about a straight line on the surface of a sphere? Mathematicians spend a long time thinking about this question, and it turns out that on the surface of a sphere, the lines that are considered straight are what's called the great circles, things like the equator and the lines of longitude, the biggest possible lines. And the reason that they are straight is because they're what's called the geodesics. They're the way in which you go from the, in the shortest distance from any point A to point B is always along a geodesic, which is always along a great circle. Now, we actually, you, you actually encounter this, the phenomena and the importance of this phenomena very regularly in your lives. And meant most of you have probably encountered it getting to this conference. Does anyone want to tell me why this geodesic issue becomes important on the surface of a sphere? That's right. When you're flying on airplanes, you want to fly the shortest distance between any two points, therefore using up the, less, the least amount of jet fuel. So, Planes fly along geodesics, which are great circles, which are the shortest possible way of getting from one place to another. So now I'm going to ask you the question again. We're going to go back to Euclid's question. We're on the surface of a sphere now, not on the surface of a flat piece of paper. How many lines can I draw through the, a point that is a straight line and never meets the original straight line? So what, what do people think the answer is? answer? The, the answer is zero. And why? Do you want to tell us why it's zero? That's right. Because on the surface of a sphere, all cir great circles intersect one another. So now we've got two situations. We've got a flat surface, and the answer to our question is one. We've got a, a spherical surface, and the answer to our question is zero. Mathematicians would think two situations, answer one, answer two. Perhaps there could be an answer three. Could there be an answer three? It turns out that in the early 19th century, people like Gauss and Boyle discovered that indeed there is a mathematically consistent system in which we can have the situation where we have an original line, a point outside it, and there is an infinite number of straight lines that go through that point and never meet the original line. And they called it hyperbolic space because you have this sort of extreme excess of parallel lines. Now, you're all probably sitting there thinking, as most people do, I'm cheating. Because when I look at that diagram, I can, the lines look curved. But the only reason they are looking curved is because I'm trying to project an image of curved, 
of a curved space, a negative curvature space, onto a flat surface. So just as when I make a map of the surface of the Earth, I say I have to distort something. So in order to represent this on a flat surface, I have to distort something. But I can actually prove to you that this situation is true. And I can do it by showing you what, hyper, what a hyperbolic surface looks like that has been made through crochet. And on this is a, a discovery of um, this discovery of hyperbolic geometry was made by a, a Latvian mathematician, Dr. Diana Taimina. And in 1993, she worked out how to make crochet models of hyperbolic surfaces that emulated the ones that you know, we see in nature. And you can stitch Euclid's parallel postulate onto these woody surfaces and demonstrate the proof of what I've just shown you. So I'm going to show you now. Uh, Maria, can I get you to come and just hold? So here we have um, a woolen surface. That, ha that This is a crocheted model of hyperbolic surface. And we have one straight line and a point and three straight lines through it. Now, I can go to prove to you that all those lines are straight, therefore proving that Euclid's parallel postulate is wrong. And the way I'm going to do it is because if I take any one of these lines and I fold along it, it makes a straight line. That's actually a physical proof that that line is straight. It's straight within the context of this surface itself. So here in yarn, done with crochet, a traditional feminine handicraft, is a proof that the most famous proposition in mathematics is wrong. It's not actually that it's wrong. It's that it only holds in a particular situation. It only holds on a flat surface. But there are other mathematical possibilities. So these surfaces, these hyperbolic surfaces made out of crochet, allow us to physically engage with abstract truths that when I learned at university, you had to take on truth, uh, sorry, on trust just by looking at equations. And so this model, it doesn't, as it were, give you any new mathematics. What it does is give you a physical way of materially engaging with abstract truths. And Dr. Taimina and her husband, David Henderson, who teach at Cornell, they use these models in their, in their classes to teach non-Euclidean geometry to math majors at Cornell. Now, this mathematics has extreme um, validity in our contemporary world because as soon as mathematicians of the early 19th century realized that there were different possible options for what a geometric surface could be like, they immediately thought, well, if mathematics offers us logically consistent options, then that raises the question, which one of these options is realized in the structure of the physical universe? So at that time, mathematicians understood that space-time, well, they, they thought in the 19th century they were just thinking of space, but that space, it had been assumed by people like Newton and Kant that space was ipso facto Euclidean, that that was, as Kant put it, an a priori truth. But now that mathematics reveals that we have other geometric options, the question arose, is the structure of space Euclidean or not? And we can actually tell how that, we can measure this by looking at how light rays behave. So if light rays from distant stars always stay parallel, we would know we live in a Euclidean surface. If the light rays converged at some point, we would know that we lived in some sort of spherical or oblate surface. If we, if we saw light rays from a long distance away gradually diverge, we would know that we lived in a hyperbolic universe. And it turns out that indeed, um, we now have an entire mathematics called Riemannian geometry that can describe generalized curved surfaces, whether, you know, any kind of bizarre structure. And this is the mathematics that underlies general relativity. So, by, so relativity has taken this geometry that emerged out of the discovery of hyperbolic geometry and applied it to the structure of space-time, which is the four-dimensional structure of the cosmos as a whole. 
And it's still a very open question. Is our universe on the largest possible scale Euclidean, spherical, or hyperbolic? Most of the evidence is that we live in a Euclidean universe, but there is some intriguing evidence that we might just live in a hyperbolic world. And so one of the things I really like about this is that it, as it were, brings together the knowledge that's embodied in sea slugs, brainless creatures, and the people we think of as the brainiest in our society, the mathematicians and physicists who are trying to work out the architecture of the cosmos. And I happened to have a lovely encounter once on a plane. I was sitting next to a woman, and I was crocheting on the plane, and she was tatting, and we got talking, and it turned out that she was a PhD student at Texas, uh, Texas University, and she was part of a research group that was looking at how flowers like calla lilies, which are hyperbolic, a version of hyperbolic surfaces, and they were studying how the calla lilies actually managed to make hyperbolic structures. And it turns out that in order to make their mathematical models work, they had to model the calla lilies in four dimensions, just as we have to model non-Euclidean surfaces uh, with uh, say, general relativity in four dimensions. And so this actually raises for me an interesting question, which is related to our sea slug question. Do, do calla lilies understand four-dimensional space? And again, I would like to say, in some sense, yes, they do. They might not be able to pass a university exam about it. They might not be able to write it down, as it were. But in some sense, they are literally playing mathematics out. In the making of their beings, they are actually enacting mathematics. And I think what one of the claims that I want to make is that in, we can begin to open out our conception of what it does mean to know mathematics by the following analogy. I'd like to make the claim that mathematics is very analogous to music in this way. With music, you can write music down. You can have it completely written out symbolically like a Mozart score. And people who have learned to read that score can actually hear the music in their head. But most people throughout history who play music don't write it out. They simply play it. People, there's a huge history of people, great musicians, who, have, who do not read or write music. Everyone from supposedly Michael Jackson to um, you know, Muddy Waters, most of the great jazz musicians, a lot of them, even people who play classical music, don't necessarily have to be able to read music to play it. And I would like to say that mathematics is a similar thing. You can write mathematics out and do it in equations and textbooks, and we need people who do that. We do actually need the formal theorizing in mathematics. But a lot of things in the world are doing mathematics. Flowers, sea slugs, corals, um, in concert halls act an incredible kind of mathematics called the Fourier transform. So I believe that mathematics is something that is, most of it in the world is literally played by the universe, by the world, by material things. And that one of the things I'm trying to argue for is the valuing and the need to take inspiration from nature, that we can do math, we can gauge with it, we can learn it, we can teach it to one another through embodied methods. That doesn't in any way valid, invalidate what's going on in universities. We need both methodologies. But most people are never going to read the equations of general relativity. However, by learning to crochet, they can actually come to a really profound understanding of the general mathematical principles that underlie general relativity. Uh, tomorrow, for those, or sorry, later today, for those of you who come to the workshop, we're going to make paper models of hyperbolic geometry out of this lovely paper technique. But I'm going to spend the rest of my talk talking more about how you can make these crochet models and the ways that lovely things come from this. So this is a mathematically precise crochet model. And it's made through using a very, very simple stitch pattern, which Dr. Dinah Tamina in, um, discovered. Just crochet end stitches, increase one. So crochet three, increase one, keep going. Crochet four, increase one, keep going. As long as you do, as it were, a regular rate of increase, 
you get these frills coming into being. And in fact, women who've been crocheting ruffles or making dancer skirts for hundreds of years have in fact been making hyperbolic surfaces. They simply didn't know it. What Dinah discovered was simply that basically making ruffles is making a non-Euclidean surface. Now, you can make them perfectly and they turn out beautifully, but they do have a bit of a similar look. They tend to look like mathematical models. 14 years ago, my sister and I um, had an idea. Well, I should just say my sister had the idea. She came home one day and she said, you know, I'm sick of making mathematically perfect ones. She had a, yeah, she had a bag of pink, fluffy and sparkly yarns that she'd bought from the craft store. And she said, I don't know about you, darling, but I'm branching out. And she, she's an artist and I come from a science background, so she tends to be more wild. And I think, oh, we should stick to the formula. And she said, well, I'm not sticking to the formula anymore. And she started to go wild and, as it were, started making aberrant ones. Instead of increasing one every three stitches, it would be like increase one every three for a while, then one every four, then one every two. And what if you want to do a bit more frilly out here and a bit less there? And as soon as she started to do that, what, she, what we discovered was that the models stopped looking like pure mathematical models, something that would be relevant in a university math class. And they started to look like nature. In particular, they started to look like corals. And that's because this is what corals are doing. Nature never makes anything mathematically perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect sphere in nature. There's only wonky spheres, like sea urchins, which are flattened, or eggs, which are bigger at one end and smaller at the other end. And that's true with hyperbolics too. Nature is in, inherent, in its mathematical incarnationing, nature is inherently queer, it's aberrant. And so, Chrissy realized that if we que literally queered the code, which is a lovely thing that she puts, way of putting it, instead of following a perfect formula, you kind of go free form, you start to develop models that look like a whole taxonomy of living things. And when we started arranging them on our coffee table, they began to look like real coral reefs. And we began to realize that, you know, just as, so, there is always a code underlying any of these models. You know, you can write the crochet pattern out as a code, like a DNA code. And just as all living organisms start with a very simple DNA code, and then gradually the code complexifies, and one day you wake up, you find you've got peacocks and giraffes. So too, we began to realize that we could play with the code, making it ever more complex and diverse. And a whole taxonomy, a whole kind of woolly diversity of crochet models came into being. And so it's like there's a crochet tree of life. And people who come to the project can, as it were, go off in their own direction and develop their own branch of the crochet taxonomic tree of life. And throughout the project, there have been, you know, wonderful people who have come and suddenly just invented something really wild. And it's like, oh my God, they've just invented mammals or, you know, like, and it's really, what we now realize, this is completely open-ended, that the whole Crochet Coral Reef project that we've been doing now for 14 years is like an open source, open-ended experiment in applied evolution. And it's really a wonderful way of, of teaching people about not only the foundations of geometry, but about the process and practice of evolution. The project is now worldwide. It can be seen as a nexus of mathematics, science, art, craft, and environmentalism. Because of course, the project was started in part for, by us as a response to the fact that global warming is devastating coral reefs. So, oh my God, what's happening? So once we realized that we could make crochet coral reefs, we, put up something on our website and invited people to join us in this project. And gradually over the years, we've seen a whole development of reefs that we have made in conjunction with a small group of collaborators around the world. And they've sort of evolved into these giant structures now, which we show in places like the Smithsonian and the Science Gallery, the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, um, the Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian, um, and it's currently, we have a whole section of this that's currently on show at the Venice Biennale. So if any of you get to Venice, I hope that you will get to see this. Why is it doing that? It's 
gone into some mode. So, but one of the things that we feel really proud about this project is that during the course of having these exhibitions, we have had two million visitors come to these exhibitions and all of them have been exposed to the foundations of mathematics. And when I give workshops, as the workshop I'll give later, to introduce people to these techniques, we always begin by having a half hour chat about the foundations of geometry and the different kinds of geometry and how it ultimately relates to the structure of the universe. And so, you know, it's a beautiful project in that you get everything from feminine handicraft to an introduction to the mathematics underlying general relativity. And I feel very proud of that because I, what I think it suggests is that there's too much siloing going on in our universe or in our society. You know, usually we have the general relativity people over here and the people studying ecology and coral reefs and global warming over here. We've got the ladies at home doing their handicraft. And this project brings it all together and suggests that all of these things actually have connections. There are literally threads of interactivity between these disparate realms. But what, there's one thing I wanted to make a comment on, particularly with regards to this context of the Excite Conference, whose theme this year is pushing boundaries. And that is that when my sister and I started this project, it had been conceived primarily as a project about mathematics and science and bringing attention to coral reefs and global warming as well as the mathematics. We had assumed that if there was interest in the project, it would come from science museums and natural history museums and that the art world wouldn't really pay it too much mind, at least not at first. The reaction was completely the opposite. From the 14 years that we've been doing this project, almost all of the shows that we've had have been in art venues places like the Haywood Gallery um, in London, the Ab Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven recently, the Cooper Hewitt Museum, um, and now the Venice Biennale. Almost all of the interest from the project has come from the art world. All of the funding we've had from the project has come from the art world. Almost all the press we've had has been in the art world. The science world has been very reluctant to embrace this project or has simply not shown any interest at all until very, very recently. And I think it's really interesting to reflect on why that might be. And if we want to talk about it more in the discussion, we can. But I'm just going to plant a little seed here that I think that the fact that the project has not really been invited into science context has everything to do with the single word, gender. And we can talk about that more in the discussion. For the moment, I just want to do a very brief in um, ending by talking about the community dimension of the project. In addition to the coral reefs that my sister and I make ourselves, which are the ones that are shown all over the world and for which we have a small group of very skilled craft co collaborators around the world, we also have a community engagement part of the project where when we put on exhibitions, we often work with the local communities and show, give them the techniques so the communities make their own coral reefs. There have now been over 40 of these, what we call satellite reefs, made around the world in over 12 countries, including Australia, USA, UK, Germany, Ireland, Latvia, and the UAE. There, collectively, in these um, satellite reefs, these community-based reefs, there have been over 10,000 citizen participants who directly build these magnificent reefs themselves. Almost all of them, they come from all works, walks of life. We've had scientists, mathematicians, computing people, prisoners, housewives, students, teachers, architects, women in shelters for homeless people. What they all have in common, these people, is that they're women people. 99.99% of the people who participated in this project have been women, have been women. And that really has surprised us, that in this day and age, that a technique like crochet is still so highly gendered. We've had, um, I just wanted to show you some of the most amazing reefs that have been made. One of the biggest was done um, at the Museum Kunst der West Coast in Germany, in Fur. That's, we had another huge, beautiful one done in Latvia. A gorgeous one was done at the Science Gallery um, in Dublin. And I want to thank Michael John Gorman for having the vision to see the validity of this project in the context of a science museum. The project therefore connects 
not only craft and corals in the cosmos, but also community engagement practices. What it is based on is engaging people through forms of, why is it doing? It is engaging people through forms of embodied knowledge practice. Instead of making them sit down and learn equations, we give them a ball of wool and say, hey, you know what? You're going to make non-Euclidean surfaces yourself. You're going to learn this through the act of making and doing. And what I do think is really wonderful about this project, why it keeps doing that, uh, it's probably because it was transfer from my Mac to another computer. Why I think this matters is, that, again, for the reason that when I raised the question earlier, does a sea slug know hyperbolic geometry? And I want to say yes. This project raises the question, also, can a housewife understand hyperbolic geometry? Can a housewife understand the principles that underlie general relativity? And the answer to that, this program shows, is definitively yes. And I think that's actually the most radical thing about the project. Thanks very much. So thank you very much for the inspiring talk. We are now open to questions and I would like to remind people in the other rooms that they need to use the hashtag Excite2019 in order to ask their questions. Or comments. Very quick question. So you uh, highlighted the community engagement aspect of the activity and you said that it's definitely clear that uh, everyone can understand. Um, is, does it come from the, dis from the discussion with the people who are taking part in the activity? How do you actually know that they understand the concept? The, the, the way that, that I think I can claim confidently that people do understand the concepts is that uh, so we start out all the workshops by giving, I give a little talk about the foundations of geometry and we talk about how this leads to the mathematics that understands relativity and the structure of the universe. And then I open up to have a discussion, well, how would we know if the universe was Euclidean or hyperbolic or spherical? And I start to ask them questions. How, would, how do you think you'd go about doing this? And basically they you know i get them to see that the way that we study the structure of space time is looking at the behavior of light rays and i ask them how they think the light waves would behave differently in different structures rather than giving them the answers as i did in my talk just now for brevity i let them explore this in their own minds and by the end of the workshops, people are asking very, very sophisticated questions about particular situations. So they have understood very much about how the structure of space-time leads to the different behaviours of light, which is basically the mathematical version of this is how do straight lines behave on different um, geometrically structured surfaces. And uh, it's always an absolute delight to me and a huge source of empowerment to them that they really do get it because they get to, they get to have revelations in their own minds about what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. I am a knitter, not a crocheter. How would I go about knitting hyperbolic space? Where would I make that increase if I had started with, let's say, three stitches? Well, it's the same with knitting as crochet. You simply, you know, knit three stitches, increase one, and then you know you go back, you go backwards and forth. It is better to start with about twenty stitches, like cast on twenty, and then go backwards and forwards. You know, knit three stitches, do one increase, knit three stitches, do one increase, and then just keep backwards and forwards in doing that. But 
but there's a very big reason why it's better to do with crochet. Can you guess what the answer is? The, the reason is, in fact, the very, you can knit it or crochet, you can do it in any kind of iterative handicraft, you can do it in tatting. There were some images on the screen that I showed of people who'd done it with beading. You can do it with any iterative handicraft. The thing about crochet that's really good is that you're always only got doing work on one stitch at a time. When you do it with knitting and you gradually increase stitches, you end up with so many stitches on the needle that you can't physically proceed. So. Dr. Tamina's first one was knitting, and then as soon as she'd done one with knitting, and I've done one with knitting, and believe me, crochets, you immediately want to switch to crochet. I, I'm puzzled by the fact that uh, this technique project is so uh, embraced by the art world, and there's not that much interest uh, from the science world. you have any idea why that is so? An assumption, an explanation? Uh, it, it, this, this, sub, this fact very much surprised me um, because I'm a science communicator. I came to the project because I was frustrated in my work as a science journalist that I thought there were two... I thought that science journal, journals and science communication as a general thing was speaking to too small a range of people and one of the range of people that a lot of science communication doesn't reach is women. So I wanted to have methodologies of reaching women through science communication. That was one of the things that I liked about the project from the beginning as I had an intuition it would appeal mainly to women. And I thought because of that that the science world would brace it because there's so much rhetoric in the science communication world and the science world in general about the need to reach out to women. But when I reached out to science funders and said, would you fund this project, I was told don't even bother to put in an application. Um, as one senior science funder to put it to me, I don't believe there's any real science in a bunch of women knitting, so don't even bother to apply. I was shocked to the core of my being about this, and I, it took, it's, my brain has resisted it, but I really do believe the issue is gender. It's a project that's done primarily by women, it was invented by women, um, a lot of the people who come to the shows and adore it are women, and I think that there is still, very sadly, and I'd, I've been very reluctant to say this publicly, but I think in the context of what about this conference here is trying to do, it's important to say, I think there remains an enormous amount of snobbery in the science world and in the science communication world that women, that some audiences are more valuable than others and that female audiences actually don't have as much prestige as male audiences. And I say that with enormous sadness. I think this is very true. I come from physics and then I moved to science communication and I work a lot with scientists and I think that science is still an elite uh, club uh, made with uh, uh, very homogeneous methods of approach to knowledge and these formal methods are a barrier for many people not only women but of course especially women and uh, I don't think it is strange that uh, scientists uh, didn't uh, accept so well your way of approaching knowledge. I think it is uh, perfectly coherent with the way of doing science now. Formal mathematics and high uh, and theoretical physics uh, are the most evaluated science in the world. They are looked up as uh, something that is unreachable for highly intelligent people and we are not, so we are not uh, e e enough intelligent to, to do such kind of things. And um, I think it is, there, it is really over-evaluated. And in the past science, it was not as such. For example, there are many examples of people who did science in the past with different methods, approaching knowledge in a different way. And one of the most stunning example is Alexander von Humboldt, who uh, his picture of the world is something that is not only amazing, but it's really something that gives you uh, an, a, a, a global idea of what is our 
Earth planet. So I think this, we must uh, go on on this track and trying to contaminate uh, uh, science with this new method of approaching knowledge. And I think that the word that you've just used is a really, really important one. You use the word contaminate. And, and I, I have come to the very sad conclusion seeing the way that this project has been received or not received in the science world is that bringing in, how can I put it in any other way, but bringing in housewives is a form of contamination to the high priestly temples of physics and mathematics. And I wrote a whole, I wrote a whole book, a, my first book about the history, I write books about the physics, the history and philosophy of physics when I'm not doing crochet coral. My first book was a book about the history of the relationship between physics and women. And there's no doubt that the history of physics is one which has been allied with a high priestly notion in which women were seen as a form of contamination. And I think it's a very sad thing that the legacy of that remains deeply embedded in our society and deeply embedded in the structures of science communication. And I'm really thrilled to see that the Excite program this year is really trying to raise these questions. There's a guy up the back. Oh, I, I promised to relay some questions from other rooms oh. via Twitter. So um, there are people commenting that actually the tweeting today about this lecture is mostly done by females in the audience. Um, and then two questions. One is asking, okay, how do you label your workshop when you offer it as a math workshop, a craft workshop or an art science workshop? And do participants already have a high level of math or science? And then someone else is asking, okay, is there another craft that males might uh, relate to? Um, well, how do we label the workshop? I, I try to label it as interdisciplinary so that it's art, science, math and craft all at once. Um, it, you don't need to have any mathematical pre previous knowledge to do it. I've done the workshop for a math department at an elite university. I've done it for architects. I've done it for high school teachers. I've done it for artists. I've done it for high school students. So it really, it, they, it cuts across all sorts of groups. Is there another uh, way of craft that, that men would do? Um, well, when, when I do the workshop that I'm going to do here, we're going to be doing it with paper modeling, not with crochet. And it's always interesting when I do the paper modeling workshops that it usually is half male and half female. But as soon as you do it with crochet, it's you know almost all women. So oh. This guy has a question and then this lady. Um, I must be one of your vanishingly small 1% of men. I participated in the uh, Bristol Crochet Reef with uh, oh, did you? Good Dr. On you. Helen Featherstone. Um, yes. Anyhow. I was not quite so aware that gender was an issue at the time I was doing it, but you know, they were all women. Um, <laughs> I think one of your obstacles is the fact that it's craft, and there is a certain snobbery about the mm -hmm. formalness of craft. And this is one of the issues in science communication, in that this is maths, this is geometry, this is hyperbolic geometry, therefore it's very hard. Mm. What we're doing here with this crochet is fun, it's interesting, it's not hard, therefore it can't possibly mm. be maths. Yes, I mean, that, that's, that, that was exactly the, this funder who turned me down, who said, and it is a very major American funder, said, we're not even going to considering funding you because I can't believe there's any real science in a bunch of women knitting. And I thought, well, one of your mission statements is to open up to new innovative modes of science communication. Where do you begin if that's not, if, if that attitude's gonna be so fixed? And a lot of my work, as I said at the beginning of my talk, is really about trying to say, yes, you can engage with really deep ideas in maths and physics through material craft play practices, through kindergarten-like practices. <laughs> and and I, think, I think to get to the point that this lady said, and, and what you're saying too is, there is a huge barrier of snobbery to be overcome here. How could you possibly engage with the, with the foundations of general relativity through something as lowly as crochet? But I'd like to ask the question the other way. Why not? 
What is so heretical about that idea? This lady has a question. May I, may I talk? Um, oh, yes. You saved my day because I always thought I was an absolute zero in mathematics, but I'm crocheting uh, <laughs> octopuses for newborn babies, and I have brought an octopusy for you to thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. And he's got little hyperbolic tentacles. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Um, I want to echo the thoughts of the gentleman and not only are craft considered lowly in science, but they're also considered lowly in arts and especially mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, you know, it's great that you're getting to the Venice Biennale. And also, um, do you think over time, because you're connecting it with serious and deep mathematics, that the, um, the image of crafts will be elevated a little bit and people will feel a little better about uh, engaging in crafts? Well, I think that the, in the art world, there has been a, a real re-evaluation of craft that's very big at the moment. And craft practices have also, as you point out, been traditionally regarded as very lowly in the art world. But that um, that's completely being re-evaluated now and there's a lot of craft practice and particularly a lot of early feminist artists who work with craft practice whose stars is now radically rising. And so the art world has been, as it were, much more in advance of the science world, I think, in valuing the position of makering. But, but, but I'd like to end on a really positive note, a thought for the future. So a lot of sessions in this conference, a lot of sessions in a lot of conferences that I've been to over the past couple of years, make a big thing about makering and tinkering. And the validity and the value and the power of makering and tinkering spaces, and every museum setting up its own makering and tinkering labs. But that's what craft practice is. <laughs> Craft practice is the original making and tinkering. But somehow when we go to, craft, to tinkering spaces now, it's electronics, it's robotics, it's computers. Now, that's all wonderful. But making is what is done with craft. It is tinkering. So again, why can't the craft practices be valued within the whole maker movement? And again, I would come back to a thing that I do think it comes down to gender. I've been into so many maker spaces, various maker conferences, and they're almost all men. And they're doing electronic stuff, and they're doing, you know, welding even. But as soon as a woman get, comes up and does, you know, knitting or sewing or crocheting or whatever, it's not valued as highly. So I think even in the whole makering movement, there is still a very gendered hierarchy. And we're just re we're just recapitulating the gender order within the new making tinkering movement. I would make the claim that women making, women making have been tinkerers and makers in the most true sense since the year dawn. <laughs> and let's value that. So thank you again, Margaret. The good news for everyone is that we can carry out the conversation in the small stage, um, so in a couple of minutes. So see you again. Thank you all for being here. After the coffee break, yes. <laughs>